Everybody, welcome to this study. We're still going over the seven churches in the book of Revelation. This is very significant in that this is the last church, the church to Laodicea, which means a people judged. We're going to get a little further into what, what does that mean. But if you were to follow our studies, we were to see that Sardis was this cornerstone pivot point in which Christ is presented, and then you have two directions to go. You either go into Philadelphia or you go into Laodicea. Philadelphia, if you go and do re, uh, review those studies, you'll see that this is the people that are alive and remain when Christ comes in the clouds of glory. These are the 144,000. These are those that go through the great trial and tribulation, the great time of trouble. These are the ones that have made the robes white through tribulation, through the crucible process, these are those that overcome the mark, the beast, the image, the number, the name, etc. Laodicea, not good. Philadelphia, accommodation. Laodicea, condemnation. So what's bizarre is when I talk to a lot of Bible students, many times people are kind of in tongue-in-cheek going, oh, we're Laodicea, you know, we're the last church, and they only see everything linear as if Laodicea is almost, well, we're still the apple of God's eyes, and, you know, we still do dumb things, you know, how we can be, you know, we're so sleepy and lazy and tired and presumptuous, pretentious, oh, lovable qualities, but, you know, but they're leaving out the whole God's going to spit you out part, these types of things. So what we're going to just address on Laodicea is the name and one very particular aspect, and that is they are blind. They don't know something. They don't know something about their condition. Therefore, they're unrepentant. They are in a place in which they have not sought, nor have they laid a hold of that which would not bring them into judgment or condemnation. So, whoa. my document's a little bit messed up. Hold on. Didn't transfer from my other uh, document. All right, guys. So what we're going to do is let's just get into the study. Um, let's try to get a hold of this concept of Laodicea. But we're just going to touch on, the, we're going to do other studies on Laodicea, but this is an opener study that I really feel is super important. So let's check this out, okay? Laodicea. All right, so the very word Laodicea, literally, it's made up of two words, right? Two words, it's laos, and it's dosia, or we're getting to the root word, is dekneo. So what is this, right? Laos means na nation, kindred, tongues, people. And that's what you see in the great three angels' message of Revelation 14 and Revelation 8, is that there is a great everlasting gospel proclamation at the end of time that goes to every kindred, people, nation, the world. And unfortunately, this dosia or decneo is the root word. It's a lawsuit, listen to this process, a judicial hearing, judicial decision, um, in particular, a sentence of condemnation, execution of a sentence, punishment to suffer punishment. What you are going to see here, folks, and this is what people are not really getting that are teaching the book of Revelation and dealing with the Laodicea church is they don't understand that this word, dosia, is all in the negative. Negative, not good. Not good. We're going to have to really look at that. And here is examples of that word. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says, who shall be punished, this is where you get dosia from, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Jude 1, 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example of what? Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Dosia. Not super good at all. Horrible. Hey, God bless. Back to Genesis. So before we kind of minimize and we're tongue in cheek, we think we're just, 
these lovable kind of kiddos that. Whoa, my document just died and disappeared. This is so crazy. I have been dealing with the craziest computer stuff. Wow, here we go again, guys. Sorry about this. All right. Wow. I'm gonna have to re put this in, guys. Wow, this is so crazy. Sorry about this. Tech stuff. All right, here we go. So we have to be careful that we haven't minimized and made ourselves a little more cute and adorable where God just ruffles up our hair and says, you guys are so lovable, I just can't even help myself. Oh, go be saved, And but you better learn your lesson. This is the kind of felt board raised in the church I've always been coddled and catered to, in which there's no real, real understanding as to the dangers uh, of not coming to this presumptuous place in which you think you are so amazing, God, that he could never really judge you, because that's really the impetus for universalism. Oh, God wouldn't do that. Well, dosia, right? We've looked at it. It is vengeance. It is punished. Well, what's interesting, the root word, right? Decneo, which I wanted to touch on, which is, I think, very powerful to understand, is the word decneo means to show, to expose to the eyes, to give evidence or proof of a thing. And you're going to see here in John chapter 3, look at verse 18 and 21. It says, he who believes in him is not condemned, not judged. You see, there's, quote, a people judged, and then there are people that are not judged. And we're talking this condemnation, negative judgment, in which you are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire or let me go back, or you are being punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. So he who believes in him is not judged nor condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the judgment or the condemnation, depends on the translation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have that they have been done in God, does not want to be exposed. This is huge, huge, huge to really understand this because we are in this very strange culture of pain avoidance, truth avoidance, and resting of narratives in which everything needs to serve our kind of self. Um, I'm going to use the word preening. Preening is like when a bird is cleaning his feathers. You know, where we are basically seeing ourselves as so beautiful, so adorable, so absolutely just unrejectable that we are going to only listen to that which tells us these things. And the susceptibility of us listening to false teachers that are going to feed into this bizarre, narcissistic kind of hungry hole inside of us that never gets enough of this sweet, sugary flattering language. And so what's sad is that when God is drawing his people near at the day of atonement in the day in which we're preparing to meet God face to face, nothing is flattering. This is going to be the point. God is drawing us into the light, but we are going to see our sinfulness. We're going to see our shame. We're going to see our nakedness. We're going to see our poverty. We're going to see our wretchedness. This is something that you have to prepare yourself for that in approaching God, you're going to see his holiness and you're going to see your filthiness. You're going to see his righteousness and you're going to see your wretchedness. You have to prepare your heart for that reality. This is what it means to fear God and to give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come. Worship. This is going to be key. So I read.
be done. Revelation 3.17 But thou sayest, I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched. We're going to get into the word wretched, which is the main part of the study. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And this is a very difficult thing for us to really get a hold of here is that in Romans chapter 7, as you're going to see, Paul realizes his wretchedness and he lays a hold of the righteousness that is in Christ through faith. And he sees, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, realizing that there is nothing, no good thing do I see in me. This is coming into the light. This is coming to the presence of God. This is laying a hold of the provisions God has made for us in care of our standing for the judgment. This is super essential that you completely understand this. We're going to look at something that I found is really interesting because it's those who insist on not seeing their need for redemption, a savior, a substitute, an atonement, a redeemer that imputes his righteousness to you and gives you his clean robes in exchange for your filthy garments. You're going to see what this result looks like because this is important for us to understand that we should come into the light knowing that we are going to have our shame and sin exposed even to the core of our internal thought and intent process. Remember, we have a faithful high priest. He's sympathetic, but he is completely going to dissect between our thoughts and our motives, and we're not going to be able to twist the narrative. That's the very essence of the word iniquity. It means to bend something at the end. It looks okay, and then there's a bend. It's false balances. It looks like your food is being measured right at the market, but they have been rubbing on the weights for a long time, and then you get false balances. We have a false sense of ourselves, and we are mitigating really even how God sees us through buying into fanciful narratives and seeking out teachers that are going to tell us exactly what we want to hear so we in no way truly seek to the level in which we're going to be saved through infinite imputed righteousness, we're never going to fully seek the provision that we desperately, desperately need. Okay, so check this out. Hey, good to see you. Indonesia. Welcome to the study. Here's the story. John chapter 9, verse 34 to 41 says, They answered and said to him, You were complete. No, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't set up the story. This is the healing of a blind man that was blind from birth. Now he's under judgment. He's facing the court. And this is a situation where this white man was blind from birth. And they had it in their mind, if you're blind from birth, it's because of a generational pass down, et cetera. So check this out. All right. Yeah, check into this study uh, later on. <clears throat> so it says, after his healing... They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sin and you are teaching us and they cast him out. Now, what's fascinating here is real fast is that he is saying, yeah, I was born blind. And they're saying you were born in sin. And what is interesting here is that this man is completely into just real fast. These Pharisees, this council wants to avoid the idea of being born in sin. This man is having to deal with the fact that he was born in sin. This man is having to deal with the sinfulness of his nature. This man is having to deal with core condemnation that you get from birth because we are estranged from the womb, that we are born in sin, and we are literally in a place of born wretchedness. Well, just like Job had realized that when he was going through his trial, when he was going through his judgment, when he was in the courts, so to speak, the cosmic court scene. This man is having to face the humility and the shame of, quote, being born in sin, born blind, born in the sense that really all men are really born in the spiritual sense. Well, he's facing this. He gets cast out of the councils of men, and you're going to see that Jesus shows up and he has a face-to-face and watched what this process 
shows us. They cast him out, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, bearing reproach outside the gate, you guys. This is what is essential for us to lay hold of and to embrace. And when he found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? In some translations, the son of man, do you believe in your savior? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? These are the works of God, that you believe upon me in whom God has sent. This is the works of God. And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. The book of Revelation is about hearing and seeing, hearing the voice of God, turning and seeing him. This is the condition this man is in. He was, quote, born in sin, blind, and in a condemnable place, and he turned to Christ. Christ had given him the command to see. And what Christ did is he healed this man. Christ is now offering to be his savior, and he is accepting this. This is what it means to be responding to every nature, na nation, kindred, and tongue, and people to really understand that there's a great everlasting gospel call going to the world, and we are to hear the voice of God so we can come into the light, see our filthy garments, and exchange the robes. Then he says, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and law. Worship him is the point, is the key to being the 144,000, those who are ready, prepared as a bride, garments made white through a process that's very, very painful and humiliating, having to see your condemnation, the fact that you were born in sin, your sinful nature. Verse 39 says, then Jesus says, for judgment, I have come into this world. See the judgment picture here? Day of Atonement stuff, that those who do not see may see. I don't see what's wrong. I don't see my evil. I don't see the sinfulness of my nature. I choose not to see. And those who see may be made blind. And so what does this mean? We're going to get into this here. Verse 40 says, Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. And this is huge to understand that it's culpability. If you say or if you see or God exposes or God reveals and God shows you everything about your condition and you choose willfully your ignorance. You willfully don't want to know. You willfully defy what God has shown you. There is no extra other place in which you're going to find your redemption, your salvation, the necessary righteousness for you to be saved and to be counted and numbered and registered in the books of heaven. If you willfully bypass that, you don't want to go through the process of humiliation and the meekness and the non-self-justifying spirit and the culpability and the owning it. If you don't want to go through owning it, if you have a problem in your life, even in regular things, owning your accountability, you are going to bounce. You're going to eject. You're going to pop out. You aren't going to deal with this whole, quote, God bringing you into the light that your evil can be exposed so you can see. Well, if you say, I see, and then you don't receive the Redeemer, you are culpable. You are left in your sin. You have not sought out the provision that God has given you in the death, burial, resurrection, the shame and condemnation, the brought to an open shame, Jesus Christ, who bore our sins, right? He was made sin for us so we could be the righteousness of God in him in the robe exchange that is necessary for that day of atonement. The willfulness of us to be ignorant of that, to want to, quote, come at me at a better time because it's really not convenient for me to own my stuff, to look at my stuff, to have these things, to do its necessary work of deconstructing my pride, my arrogance, my self-sufficiency, my 
bizarre ability to always be able to twist the narrative to somehow make me the victim or the hero or some righteous, sinless, innocent being, and to never really come into the place of broken humility of our sins sticking to us like Velcro saying, yeah, yeah, you're actually guilty. You are actually going to have to come to God in brokenness and, and the humility. You must know that you were born in sin and you practice that sin. God help us for cleansing. So willful ignorance, not cool. So let's get into the concept of willfully ignorant, right? Kusios, which is something that's unforced, voluntary, willing of one's own accord. No one has forced you. A lot of people use this whole idea that, well, you forced me to, to lie. You forced me to twist the narrative. You forced me because that forced me to deal with my shame. This is this wrong idea of, of I was forced to. I was forced to defend myself. I was forced to give you another definition of what really went on. I was forced into it. No, you weren't. Having to bear your culpability, your guilt, your shame, your accountable. Yes, this charge sticks to you. Doesn't force you to be a liar. Doesn't force you to twist the narrative. Doesn't force you to flip the script and say, no, 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 what you're accusing me of, I'm accusing you of, et cetera. No, no, when God is bringing you into the light is so you can own it, so you could be humbled by it, so you can, your mouth is shut, you have no excuses. You're not coming in with the next level of, let's look at it a different way, isms. God is saying that's willful ignorance. You weren't forced into doing that. You have a provision, you have a savior. You have one who's laid down his life. You have one who's entered into your shame, who himself is without any sin, without spot, without any taint of sin upon him. And in fact, he's the truly offended party and he bears our sin. And yet we don't want to enter into true guilt and the culpability of it when the very person that is pointing these things out, God and the Holy Spirit, and revealing these things, exposing these things, like we talked about for the root word for dosia, that we have God's forgiveness that he paid from his own soul bank account. So we're not forced. It's called willful ignorance. So, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, 7, 10 through 12, it says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto what? Fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men and women. But the day, day of atonement, day of the Lord, will come shockingly, unexpectedly, suddenly as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up. We're going to talk about God's burning up our works of chaff and wheat and thorns and thistles and stubble and the things that he exposes in our life that is just nothing but sawdust from a wicked workshop. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and in godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, the day of atonement, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Here's another where this word willfully, that your good deed may not be by compulsion as it were, but voluntarily. Hebrews 10, 26 says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. And so this is important that we understand. The reality is, is that it's not saying that though if you sin one time after you already knew, like it's not saying that it's talking about 
Where are you going to go for your salvation? Where are you going to go for your redemption? Where are you going to go for your salvation if Christ and the process that he brings you through and bringing you into his presence, his judgment, into his throne room, to reveal your sins, and he's there to do a robe exchange, and you are going to just bypass that process? You're going to drive right around that and think you're going to move on to eternal life? You're not. There is no sacrifice for sins outside of Christ bringing you into the judgment hall in which you can do business with your Savior and your Redeemer. You can't just say, I want to get past that. I want to move past that. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin if you think you're going to bypass this process of true confession, contrition, owning it, having your eyes open, and realizing that you were born in sin and that you have got to allow yourself to go through this great humbling process in order, and its, and its purpose is to carve out meekness, to literally carve out the humility that is in Christ without him needing to be, quote, guilty of sin. Christ is already humble and meek. He's already long-suffering and merciful. He's already gracious. He's already patient. He's already those things. We, unfortunately, in our sinfulness and our natural pride and being puffed up and lifted up, need to be humbled, need to be broken, need to own our stuff. We need to be brought down. Our balloons ascend too high, too fast, too hard, too often. God has got a balloon pop in order for us to display the natural character of Jesus Christ, who he is by his own personal nature. He is humble and merciful and meek and kind and lowly, all the fruits of the spirit. You see this gentle, you see these qualities about Christ, but he didn't need to be humbled. We do. Sin is that pervasive. Sin is that seductive. Sin is that infused in every part of our being that we can't even analyze ourselves correctly because we're too busy from the basis of our analysis, from our paradigm, we're already fused up and fizzled up and somehow foamed up in our sin and our and our bad assessments that even from our point of judgment, we judge wrongly all the time in regard to our own condition. The heart is desperately wicked. Wicked, wicked, desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Who could know it? Why are we consulting with the very like yeast infected heart that from its own perspective cannot truly give a right assessment because we're unclean. We're already, our platform is pride, self-sufficiency, arrogance, delusion. Okay. So here we go. So I'm going to get into this you knew thing because this was also, you're going to see here, this judgment picture of Belshazzar and Daniel. And really, I got here, it says, uh, you knew, right? And you're going to see this, that when Belshazzar um, was judged and the handwriting was on the wall, this is a picture of this, you knew, but you dismissed it. So I'll just put it to Bel. It just means Belshazzar, to protect the king. Bel, protect the king, Belshazzar. And what you're going to see here is that there's Belshazzar and then there is Belteshazzar, which is Daniel. Daniel and Belshazzar were raised together. It's interesting when you want to get into the history of this whole thing of Daniel and Belshazzar. It's because they were both named Belshazzar. And the only difference in Daniel's Belshazzar is the letter Tau was T, which was really a um, ancient way of saying that these are those that are possessed by Bel, but they are heretics to the religion of it. In other words, they don't but they don't subscribe to the religion of Bell, but they are under uh, ownership of Bell. That's why the T is inside of it. It's like a mark. It's interesting when you want to get into it. It's very fascinating. But what you're going to see here is Daniel was actually raised with Belshazzar. Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Daniel was the same age. And what you're going to see here is that Nebuchadnezzar really liked Daniel and had respect for him at some point and had him to try to be a playmate or good influence on, Belteshe on Belshazzar, uh, which is his grandson. And Daniel explained all of these interesting things. And when his own grandpa went through his own kind of humiliation process and Daniel was there to show him these things, what's well, very fascinating, well, Daniel later on comes into the scene again 
and says, but you knew all these things. You knew the things that you were taught. You knew these things, and yet you were willfully ignorant, and now you're judged. Many, many tekel ufares. You have basically been weighed in the balances and found wanting. This is Laodosia. It is not a, a cute, cuddly, oh, you incorrigible little rascal, you. No, you're dead. You're weighed in the balances, found wanting. You're spewed out. This is not good being laid to see it. Not, not good. Not even only not good. You lose everything. You're condemned. The judge stands at the door. He knocks. And you decide you're going to wall yourself up like Jericho. You think that Jericho fared well under God's judgment when he says, open up. Show me your nativity. Show me your, your scarlet cord your umbilical cord, reveal your harlotry. You were born in sin, the council tells the blind man, ex-blind man. You have to come to God naked, confessing. You have to let him reveal these things. And what's interesting is when that ark was surrounding Jericho, that ark was God's bedchamber out in public. It was his bed, his bed, his resting place, his shekin, his shekinah glory. This was his bedchambers that he is parading in public and he is circling as if it's a wedding ceremony, Jericho. And this harlot brings down a, quote, scarlet cord, which is representational of her umbilical cord, her nativity, that she was not born. She's natural, not a natural born child of God. And God redeemed her and protected her. Holding on to your sin never plays out the way you think it's going to play out. All right, here we go. Daniel 5, here we go. Verse 20, 22, 24 to 25. Verse 30 says, and when his heart was lifted up, his heart was lifted up, his just his heart, this is the invisible part, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. This is Daniel reminding him what happened to Grandpa Belshazzar is having a conversation with Belshazzar. One Belshazzar is saved. The other is lost. One son of man is saved. The other is lost. Son of God is lost. That's the same picture of Jesus and Barabbas. Bar Abba, son of the father. Here we go. We have a Jesus Barabbas saying, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not what? Humbled your heart. Humbled your heart. Heart was lifted up. Humble your heart. Spirit was hardened in pride. Humble your heart. Ready for this? Although you knew all this. Although you knew all this. Oh, no. Oh, no. You feel sick? You feel like you're going to throw up, Belshazzar? The knees were knocking, right? His bowels were loosed. And the fingers of the hand were sent from him. This writing was written. This is the inscription. Oh, man. Beware that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That was written many, many, which is money, money. Tekel, which is shekel. Ufaras, which is paradise or the kingdom that is gained. And you've lost it all. There are others that will go in and you won't. And it says that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. It's not cute being Laodicea that doesn't allow the light to shine to expose your sins so you can receive the benefit of the atonement holding on to your pride, being judged when the kings of the east, which is right, a picture of Christ. It says in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45, it says that Cyrus, who's going to come and take out Babylon a hundred years before this whole event even happened. It says that this king of the east is a Mashiach, a Messiah, a savior, an anointed one, a picture of Christ, a type of Christ when Christ comes for, as the kings of the east and he's coming to deliver his children from the captivity of Babylon, which is all through the book of Revelation, which is a type, 
of what this world is and God's redemptive giant epic rescue process. So we should go back and study everything that happened in Babylon and understand its current and its contemporary application to us now. We just read it. So it's interesting. I'll read on a little bit. The first, remember, Belshazzar, the king, when Daniel was having his visions in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, it was during the Belshazzar years. A lot of people don't really have that very clear. And right here, I'm just showing basically Belteshazzar. You see the T that's in here. Um, his name was just a little bit different in that right here, it just says, um, means Tazar. And what's called a Zendik, in other words, uh, he's a heretic of Bel, uh, a name given to the East of those who charge with disbelief of any revealed religion, is a mark of the genitive. In other words, marks a person or thing that possesses it. In other words, he's trying to say, okay, that, um, yeah, I have that name. I'm possessed of Bel, which, which is like protect the, Bel protect the king. It just basically just means that I'm a heretic to the religion of Bell. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's very interesting. But Bell possesses me. Okay. So what's so interesting about this is that you have these two players, and this is what I'm trying to tell you. Barabbas, Christ, Belshazzar, Belteshazzar. You have this crossroad. And this is what you're looking at with Philadelphia and Laodicea. Brotherly love, love one another that they may the world may know that you are my disciples keeping the law of God, keeping the commandments of God, love God, love one another as I have so loved you, love one another, right? This is what it means to have the law of God written upon your hearts. This is what it means to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This is all Philadelphia. These are those that will be made a, a pillar in the temple of God. These are those who will be conquerors and wear crowns and will overcome the beast, the image of the beast, the number, the name through the crucible and to be purged and made white and to have her garments be cleansed through the affliction and the trials at the end of time. Laodicea says, no, thank you. I'd rather just hold on to my drunken stupor like Belshazzar, and I'm going to go ahead and be pretentious and presumptuous. And then they bring up the sanctuary pieces and in his foolery, in his mockery of God, he's judged. The sanctuary comes into play and judges him, and he realizes he has lost the kingdom. We have got to be in touch with what is essential. Romans 7 is telling us a true x-ray of our soul. This is Paul saved. We'll get into a whole study of Romans 7 sometimes, and I really want you to be there when I show you that Romans chapter 7 is not Paul sinning. He's realizing the sinfulness of his nature, but he's not willing to engage in it, but he realizes in that process how horrific his nature was, that it was wretched, that it was poor, miserable, blind, condemnable, born in sin, just like the blind man of John chapter 5. There is where you hear Jesus. There is where you see Jesus. There is where you believe him, and there is where you worship him. Worship comes from you being in the state where Paul was at in Romans chapter 7, when he realizes this is what it means to walk in the spirit, that there is no condemnation in Christ. The condemnation is in our flesh. And if we are joined to our flesh, we're joined to our idols. The greatest idol in this world is you, your flesh. We are the clay idol. We are the teraphim. We are the gullum. We're going to get into a whole series of study on the gullum and the clay and the, quote, worship of this need of healing in our soul in which we create this image. A whole series on the gullum. The monster that is me. That is us. And we think that building up this little Frankenstein monster is going to heal us and save us. It's going to destroy us and destroy every single thing that's going to get us to stand right before God on the day of judgment. So what does God do as a provisionary, prescriptive, medicinal, as, as the great apothecary pharmacist that Christ is? What does he do? He gives us the medicine of ISAV so we could see 
and understand the putrid wretchedness and the corruption of our own soul that we could flee desperately to our Savior who is mediating in our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. I hope this is getting through. The so Romans chapter 7, verse 24 says, Oh, wretched man. These are only two times the word wretched is ever used in the New Testament. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? Your idol that you are living in. Don't be attached to your idol. Don't be attached to your flesh. Don't be attached to the clay man. You see, what you're going to see here is in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, when the man who was standing there in the giant idol picture that is destroyed by the great stone cut out without hands, he is destroyed at his clay feet. This is where our idolatry is. And the clay picture we'll get into in the whole Gollum study that we're going to get into here. It's already prepared. We can get started tomorrow if you want. Is this Gollum, as you will see here, is this healing? Remember, Jesus healed this very blind man with clay. So it was seen as a medicinal property. So Jesus used his spit, took the mud of the ground, and then put it on the man's eyes, and it was a picture of a creation, a clay thing. Man was made from the clay or the mud of the ground, the mire of the ground, and it's this picture, as you'll see here, but we make our own golems, our own teraphim, our own images uh, that represent ourselves, and we invest in those images, and we protect those images, and we feed those images, and it becomes our Frankenstein's monster and takes over the rest of our life, and we never want to put it to death. We never want to put our golem, our monster, our our little baby to death. So Paul is seeing the golem, the monster, the clay man that he's attached to and saying, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's interesting, the word wretched in the Greek that's only used two times means to be tested in trial or weighed in the balances. That's why I brought up Daniel chapter five. It's interesting, the word here, right? Taliporos is to bear, to undergo, to endure toils, troubles, affliction, to be wretched, to realize your weakness, to realize. And what does God do? He brings us through what? Toils, dangers, right? To undergo trials, affliction. This is God's medicine for us to not, quote, seek our own form of medicine, which is our own clay image making in which we're asking everyone to bow down and worship but we think that's what our he that's what is going to constitute our healing we go ahead and build an image we get everyone to love it and to worship it be it victim in image be it hero image be it the suffering servant image whatever image that we want everyone to sit there and to fawn over to love over and then we sit there and we siphon and we vicariously through some kind of bizarre kind of way of vicariously enjoying, and we think that's what our healing is constituted of, of the worship of this clay man that we've created. And we think we could blow life into it. This is the essence of these terra firm, these terra firm, these uh, terra firm idols in which they're made of you. You're making an image of yourself and then you're worshiping that image. I know somebody very well that I was in very close relationship with who now their entire ministry is making physically made an image of themselves and worshiping that image. And then try to get everyone else to worship that image. And they believe that that's the image of God, that they are the embodiment of the image of God. And they're going to sit there and the giant gaping wounds and holes in their own soul is going to be healed by everyone worshiping this manufactured, very well preened and, um, and, uh, you know, when you invest heavily into your image and you invest heavily into everyone really kind of, you know, because you're managing your image, you're 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 the PR person for this image monster that you've created. And then you get everyone to think how awesome and beautiful and amazing and whatever it, it all is. Well, God's medicine is wretched. Romans seven revelation, Holy Spirit, exposure, light, loathing. Renunciation, seeking Christ, no condemnation in him, realizing what it means that there is no condemnation, no separation, and you are beloved in Jesus Christ.
So <clears throat> root word to wretched is the scale of a balance, a balance, a pair of scales. Seeing that you're under judgment, it is the Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar's feast. So poros, the second part, is trial. It scales of balances and a trial. That's what wretched means. It brings you to trial, brings you to the courtroom, brings you in indictment, brings you to a prejudgment judgment. Poros. Hebrews 11.36 and others had trials. Cruel mocking, scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds of imprisonment. It's the idea of, literally, it's real interesting. It's to bring something forth to the light. It's to bring something forth as evidence, bring something forth in a court case to expose things that one thought was legit, not legit. We tried to cover it up, but it's uncovered. We tried to disguise something, but in the court, in the process of discovery, God's bringing it to court and to show it of its real criminal intent, criminal nature. It's interesting that when God brings us through the trial, through the testing, and he does it by calling us to obey him, to trust him, to love him, to love God, to love one another, and to do his will, you will never meet your, quote, loathsome self more than when you are obeying God. When you obey God, you get to meet you and your golem on the road, right? That weird adage, uh, the, the uh, Buddhist would even say that. If you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him, you're thinking, what does that even mean? It just means, you know, it's just the idea of ego. You're going to face yourself at some point on your journey. Are you going to sit there and worship? Are you going to team up with yourself in some bizarre kind of, you know, um, twin kind of monster process in which you're going to kind of, Tweedle D and Tweedle Dumb yourself with you and your image throughout the world, and think that this is the the healing medicine for your soul to help your low self esteem or your catastrophic low self image or whatever it is. Is it going to be like Lenny and George of of Mice and Men, just creating crimes and havoc wherever you go? And your big stupid ego is going to be out there. To get you more trouble than killing all the, the little, the pretty little mouse. Be careful. When you see your big monster, well, you should crucify him. Numbers 11, 14, 15 says, I'm not able to bear all these people alone. This is Moses because the burden is too heavy for me. Why does God give you burdens sometimes? Why? So you can meet your wretchedness. Your weakness. Things that you don't want to see in yourself. If you, God, treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my what? Wretchedness. Even, even Moses <coughs> had this wrestling match with this. So we're going to look at the Hebrew equivalency to the New Testament word wretched. And I'll show you what God reveals in our life. Isaiah 33, verse 5, then 10 through 16, it just says, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. See, when God brings you into his glorious presence, he has filled Zion with justice and righteousness, right? The revelation of his glory. Now I will rise, verse 10, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. Now, what do you see when God exposes his glory and he absolutely fills the earth with his glory? He fills the temple with his glory. You are filled with the presence of his glory. You shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. You realize that everything you bring forth, you give birth to is chaff, wood, hay, and stubble. And the people shall be like the burnings of lime, like thorns cut up. They shall be burned in the fire. You see nothing good about yourself. Thorns, thistles, chaff, stubble. When God's glory is uplifted and he exposes his glory, just like in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah now sees the temple 
and the temple is shaking and God is filling the temple with the train of his glory. And now he's unraveled. He's undone. He says, Duma, I'm a dead man. I see no good thing in me. Oh, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. He can't even speak. His mouth is closed. He has no excuses. And it takes the temple services for the angels to come to give him the ability to rise up and to speak. And now from there, he says, go, I send you. Go tell the world what you just saw. You just were exposed and witnessed my glory. We wonder why God allows us to go through things in which we are not, quote, empowered. And God says it is about disempowering. It's about pulling the drain. It's about when you are weak, then you are strong, strong in what? Faith, <laughs> trust, dependency. When I am weak, then we are strong in not trusting ourselves, strong in trusting in God. Enter into the irony of being God's child, of being a person that is brought through the process of entering into his presence, entering into his glory. We're falsely being taught that by entering into his glory, we're going to be swept up in this real sense of bizarre ecstasy of, wow, how amazing I am and how much God just is so into me. And no, 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 this is another spirit. Look at what happens when God's people that are actually recorded in the Bible when they come into his presence. There's a huge unworthiness reality that comes upon you. You conceive chaff, wood, hay, stubble, thorns. And you who are near, excuse me, here, verse 13, you who are far off, what I have done, and you who are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. That makes sense. Fearfulness has seized hypocrites. <laughs> hypocrites. Oops, I'm sorry. Conceive chaff, bring forth stubble, thorns, thistles, sinners in Zion are afraid, fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell in everlasting fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? So who are those? Who dwells in the presence of God? You see, Satan has created a macabre, twisted idea that living in the eternally in the presence of fire is satanic, is evil, is tormenting. For him it is and was. The wicked are destroyed like chaff. Believe it. The scripture is clear about it. But what's powerful, you guys, is you know who actually dwells in everlasting burnings? Ask Daniel's three friends. Ask anyone who has stood before the king. He is a consuming fire. To be in his presence throughout all of eternity is eternal life. Who could stand? Everything will be slain by the brightness of his glory. And a fiery stream issues out before him. And he is a fiery minister of his own law. Who could stand? Who could stand? The hypocrites cannot stand. Those who keep their sins cannot stand. Those who desire to not see, to not receive the true eyes have, who are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, they are condemned, they are judged, they are Laodicea. <clears throat> well, he who walks up right, he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed. You don't want to hear it. You want to just live in your fantasy and whatever people tell you. You stop your ears from hearing of the bloodshed that you create, the ripples of issues that you create. You don't want to be accountable. You don't want to be responsible. You don't want to know that you're the one that created the entire ripple effect. You should be despising the gain of your oppressions. You should be and then the one who gestures, that's nuances, gestures with your hands. That's the games and the signaling and the kind of innuendoing nuances that we play that we're not even wanting to be accountable for. Refusing bribes. What does that mean? What is a bribe? You put yourself in a place of importance and you want people to come and grovel before you. Who stops your ears from hearing of bloodshed. When people tell you what you're doing and how wrong it is, you don't want to hear it. 
It shuts your eyes from seeing the evil. Willfully ignorant. Rich and increase of goods have need of nothing. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. And you think this is end time to understand this at the end of time? It says that your bread will be given, your water will be sure. Only those who come into a place of great meekness and humility, and they're exposed for their inner workings, their inner processes, and they're coming before God to have the exchange of their filthy garments for his robes of righteousness. There is no self-justification. There is no twisting of the script, excuse making, flipping the script and mitigating circumstances made me do this. And I was forced to do it because this person was really scary to me. And I was just so afraid for how my ego would receive, you know, the shame and the condemnation. I've always had a self-esteem problem, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever reasons we have for never, ever becoming fully culpable to what we participate in. You're going to have to learn how to be naked before God. You're going to have to learn how to let God tear your walls down. You're going to have to let God enter into the unself-protected place. And then he's going to have to, quote, if your place is going to be, quote, on high dwelling, seated in heavenly places at the right hand of God through Christ, your place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given and your water shall be sure. That's about being naked before God and letting him take care of you like he took care of the children of Israel in the wilderness. The self-provision piece is not cool. Now, what's interesting here is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at God's, quote, sanctification process. The medicine he prescribes from his pharmacy of heaven is affliction, trial, testings, to bring you down to your, quote, true self, to truly create the meekness and the lack of self-reliance and lack of self-dependence upon the golem, the monster, the man, your healing monster that you build in your image, wanting all to bow down and worship like Nebuchadnezzar had done in the plains of Shinar, and he was humbled for that process. Belshazzar was warned, and he should have took heed, but it cost him his life. His grandpa was saved. Grandson, El knucklehead him smoking crack and drinking and doing his stupid stuff, however he decides to play his little games, will <laughs> always be protected. It's not like we have that in our world now, right? And so, no, I'm okay. I'm the son of the king. Dead. I remember when Belshazzar left his laptop at that shop. It was a terrible, terrible mistake. Very embarrassing to Nebuchadnezzar. All right, so here we go. So here's the medicine. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10 says, and lest I should be exalted above measure. That's a key working phrase, and it's actually from the wretched kind of comments that uh, we were looking at in the Old Testament, you guys. The Old Testament, it's to conceive chaff, to conceive of thorns and this, to conceive of these. You start to realize that it's stubble, it's chaff, it's nothing. That's what the word wretched means. So you're going to see that that same word in the Old Testament is used in Isaiah chapter 5. We'll get into it in just a minute. And you're going to see that this is, this phrase here, exalted above measure is the key phrase. There is a natural puffing up of self. There's a natural leaven that rises up within us. If we're left alone for five minutes, we naturally exalt ourselves above measure more than what we are. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, conceiving thorns and thistles, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be what? Exalted above measure. There is a natural puffing up of the leaven you just let the dough sit long enough and it's going to rise up nice, big, and shiny. For this thing, I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Of course, we don't want it. Remember what Moses said? Kill me. I don't want to deal with my wretchedness. I'd rather die. Well, this is the process of crucifixion. This is what it means to walk with Christ and to be crucified and to bear your cross. You do. It's almost, it's unbearable. God, I can't take it. This is too much. 
Hello, the medicine, the medicine for pride, the medicine for self-sufficiency, the medicine that is supposed to be a type of laetrile, a type of a type of uh, core medicine that's going to have to kill this cancer of self-exaltation, self-protection, self-coddling, self-worship, our clay man, our teraphim, our gullum, our little monster. He's still my little baby. He's 20 feet tall. Marching, stomping through Tokyo, tearing apart the city. But that's my baby. Yeah, ruining your life, ruining your relationships, ruining everything. Your golem's out of control. Your image, your monster's out of control. And you want the clay man for your healing. And he's ruining you. And it might depart from it. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient. What is grace? Christ imputing his righteousness based upon the work that he had done where he bore our affliction and it all fell upon him, his shoulders. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. He's not talking about feelings of strength. He's talking about the strength that we have before God, the strength that you gain in what? Having faith in somebody else's attainments. It's made perfect in weakness. This is the exact climate that God wants to put us in to apply the medicine of the character of Christ, meek, lowliness, gentleness, amiable, tender-hearted, merciful, patient, long-suffering, kind, but also clear about sin, knowing the difference between good and evil. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmities. Hey, once you kind of get into the program of this medicine, glory in it. Just embrace the trial, embrace the affliction, embrace the process. You see what the medicine looks like? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Watch this. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities. Do you? Do I? Have we embraced the process, the medicine? In reproach? What's reproach? People literally punishing you for something that they're accusing you of. Be it true or not. In necessities, putting you into a very precarious situation. In persecutions, he's going to glory in this. In distress for Christ's sake. The very thing that the church avoids now because we want to be seen as social justice warriors, that we are the new abolitionist. <laughs> Admire me. Look at me, I'm an abolitionist. <laughs> We're not creepy. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In faith and in confidence in what? Christ. You see, we're laying all the wrong foundation. The building of faith in which we live our life is built on this monster creating in which we want to be coddled and cudgeled and loved and fawned over and petted and cooed over. These are, this is our monster. God has got to bring some pretty harsh, severe, bitter medicine. So, Worst. So, so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 through 15 says, You are God's fellow workers, you are God's field. You see, God is He's pulling the weeds. You're God's building. You see, He's not gonna put in bad timber according to the grace. Remember, my grace is sufficient for you of God, which is given to me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. What's the foundation? And another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Be careful. Fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. Don't let the timber and the ingredients and the various materials of pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency and all the little 
tools of manip manipulation that we use that we think are going to get us through this life, the bad, bad material. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. From the bottom all the way to the top, build upon faith and trust in somebody else's righteousness. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, are you ready later to see gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, stubble? Each one's work will become clear. For the day, the day of atonement, the day of judgment, will declare it, brought to the light, Laodicea, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test, test Laodicea, balances brought to the trial and test each one's work, what sort it is. And you're going to see that you brought forth wood, hay, and stubble. Verse 14 says, if anyone's work, which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. How many of us think we're going to have tons of rewards in heaven, but it was all an image to self, all a bowing, everyone bow to the mighty gull himself. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. God, I don't want to suffer loss. 